afternoon, good morning. Thank you so much for good taking good. your time joining this uh, for the session today. Sorry, I was hearing some noise. Um, thank you for taking your time and joining us for this session today. Uh, we are calling it the Opulent Buyer's Odyssey and um, mapping social conversations in the luxury beauty industry. Uh, we thought this was relevant for this time because we are almost or actually in the holiday season already. And this last two months, one and a half month will be super crazy in the US and across the globe. So we thought, uh, why not talk about understanding consumer journeys in this uh, luxury beauty industry, which is definitely uh, one industry that gets very busy this year, this time of the year. Uh, so yeah, we thought, why not uh, talk about consumer journeys in the social media space using social listening? Um, so, which is why we have two amazing guest speakers for the day. We have Katya Ermak, who is the Senior Director of E-Commerce at Evlom. Uh, Evlom is, um, you know, uh, uh, luxury beauty product uh, uh, company, manufacturing company uh, uh, based on, um, what do you call it, bio? Uh, I can't really tell exactly uh, how that is, but I'll, you know what, I'll let Katya talk about it. She will do a much better job than I'm doing right now. <laughs> I messed it up, but, uh, uh, but uh, we'll have uh, the speakers introduced in a quick second, but we also have Sveta Kalenska, who is the CEO and co-founder of Lila Global Consulting. They are a social media consultancy for multiple brands and agencies uh, on a global scale. So they work with uh, brands and agencies across the globe for their social media, digital uh, marketing, all sorts of needs. Um, so with that said, let's dive into the conversation. Uh, but let's first have intros from the speakers. Uh, so Katya, we can start with you and then Sweda, you can take over after that. Um, hi, as I said, I'm Katya. I'm joining from New York City. I'm a senior director of e-commerce at um, luxury skincare brand Evolm. Evolm has been in business for about 36 years. Um, brand got changed hands uh, and ownership a few times, uh, so it was on a decline for a while. But in the last in the last two years, um, the company has been very growth oriented. And we definitely see that growth kind of going up. We are a British uh, native brand, however, we're headquartered in New York City. Thank you, Katya. Sveta? Hi, everyone. Nice to meet. Uh, nice to meet you all, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is Sveta. Uh, I am also based out of New York City, and I have been in the social listening industry for surprisingly 15 years. I always say surprisingly because I, in my mind, I still think of this industry as evolving and changing quite a bit. I specialize in professional services and research services, so basically Boolean coding across multiple uh, softwares. And I am extremely delighted to be here today and share the stage with Katya, who I've actually worked with in several prior careers and lives. Um, so in the latest uh, iteration of our work, I'm happy to uh, put it in the perspective of Eve Lom, which uh, for those of you who are not as familiar with Eve Lom, it's one of the premier uh, skincare uh, brands here in the U.S. Uh, you can find it at Saks, you can find it in Allure Boxes, uh, and it's really been an exciting journey uh, to see where the brand started from several years ago, as Katya mentioned, with the rebrand and where it is now. Again, thanks to... Um, e-commerce strategies and digital strategies in general. So I'm excited to talk to you guys about um, all of that today. Cool, thank you so much, Katya and Sveta. I appreciate that. And Katya, you did a much better job explaining what the company does. I really did very bad there, but thank you. Uh, so let's start with uh, understanding trends, you know, since we're entering the holiday season and also, you know, it's important to understand consumer trends around multiple things um, during this time. So uh, let's talk a little about that. Uh, it's for both of you, so anyone can go. Uh, what I'm trying to ask you is what recent trends have you observed in the luxury beauty industry, uh, both using social listening and also otherwise? Um, Katya, I want to go first. I think the biggest trend in, in the last couple of years is that uh, consumers are um, like within inflation and how market is um, being quite shaky. Um, the consumers are still investing in uh, luxury skincare. Um, this 
they still kind of buying and repurchasing. There are a little bit more price gushes, and you will notice, especially um, like Black Friday coming up, that uh, November is really busy with discounts, and everyone's discounting from retailers to brands um, to different partnerships. However, um, the kind of the industry kind of change in terms of like how this is being discounted and, and um, what what type of promotions. Definitely, we're seeing that the the length of the promotions increases. So before it was just just the Black Friday day, for example. Now it's been now it's been super promotional. And it's like the whole month of November, and it's even the brands and the luxury um, luxury brands who have never discounted start going even like deeper in, into discounting. So I think that's like kind of just what on my mind in the last few weeks. Yeah. And as you talk about discounts, it's funny, I'm actually taking notes here, so I make sure I don't forget everything I wanted to mention. From a consumer standpoint and social listening, so not only in the perspective of the beauty skincare industry, but in other, in general retail, what we've seen in the last six months, especially in the last year, have been several things. So as Katya just mentioned, discounts are obviously quite big around the holidays. It is a very uh, typical trend that we've noticed year over year. Uh, this year, more significantly, uh, with the uh, economic updates, especially here in North America, where we uh, function as a, as a company and most of the clients that we work with are here. Um, from other standpoint, this year has been quite interesting. So thinking about putting things in perspective of through the lens of social listening, uh, there are several key trends that we've noticed. The first one is that consumers across the board for retail and for beauty have been more focused on uh, the boxes and like box experiences. So as I mentioned, boxes such as Allure um, and other brands, um, consumers prefer to receive smaller packages and smaller portions in order for them to be able to test out a uh, specific product before they actually commit to it. Most of the times we've noticed that, especially in those last six months, that that's due specifically to pricing. Um, brands that other than Allure that I can mention uh, are Sephora, so we've done quite an extensive research around that. Um, and also consumers are very, uh, from again social perspective, are very interested in uh, targeting. So what I mean by targeting is targeted messaging and messaging on ads. Uh, they have reflected and have um, responded better when it comes to ads that are tailored to their demographic or their specific focus and interest. So prime example, uh, we've seen in the beauty industry specifically this year across several clients that weddings uh, and moms um, are basically better targeted and perform better as a segment if the messaging they've been receiving uh, from these brands have basically has basically been tailored towards them. Other focus that we've noticed again with demographics um, has been sexual orientation or uh, skin skin tones for cosmetics specifically, uh, as well as actually nail polish companies. And then the third very interesting trend that we've noticed, I'm sure we can't escape the elephant in the big room, is chat GPT. So when it comes to influencers, the analysis that we have worked on across beauty brands and again, retailers, big retailers, and even CPG, has been that influencers have been seeking to automate their messaging. And that actually has not worked well for many of the brands who partner with influencers. So those who have leveraged uh, ChatGPT or Bing or other services in the AI space um, to create messaging have underperformed than those who have kept it a bit more natural. So it is a reminder that consumers are smart and they do like the personal touch and the personalized touch. Um, so if there are any influencers out there or brands working with influencers, it's definitely important to mention that piece, that if you're working with any uh, personas, you definitely want to keep that tone to towards the natural and organic communication and conversation, uh, as well as video production versus uh, anything too, too good to be true. 
Cool. Uh, thank you so much, Katya and Tweta. Uh, you really mentioned some interesting trends, and I think my next question is a, you know, it's a good segue to the next question. You talked a little about messaging, uh, Tweta, uh, and then uh, talked about AI and how it kind of underperformed in a way. So my question here is, how can brands effectively leverage these trends? You know, understanding, okay, this is the trend, and then using that insight to, uh, for content creation or digital strategies. So how can they effectively use these trends for that? Uh, Katya, Sweta, anyone can go first. Yeah, happy to jump in since I'm already on a roll with uh, with content. I mean, it's tough for me to say uh, how brands cannot use these trends because as we've seen, if you want to stay relevant, you have to stay on top of uh, on top of what's happening uh, within your specific market or your specific segment. From the social media landscape, uh, we uh, work with several brands uh, that are currently really diving deeper into jumping automatically as soon as a trend comes. Basically, they want to be the first uh, or spearheading uh, those trends in terms of content and also in terms of type of content. So as we know, uh, content types change over time and they change pretty fast. Also, colors. Uh, in the content. So if we talk about multimedia, uh, including video, uh, there are almost every month new trends within uh, angles, colors, or even elements that are featured. Social listening provides a great or the great ability to be able to really stay on top of these trends. So from the perspective of any brand, even outside of the beauty uh, industry, we're able to leverage alerts and signals uh, to help us signify what is really happening. If there's any type of spike, whether that's in volume or in a trend or within a wide space industry and where it's happening and how fast it's happening. So think in the perspective of airlines or any, any company that could potentially be dealing with a PR crisis. These alerts can really help brands stay on top of basically how to talk to their consumers and what uh, may become or start trending. When, it, when we put it in the perspective of beauty, uh, I've noticed personally that throughout my experience over those 15 years that I've been in the space, uh, companies have been many, or at least of the clients that I've worked with have been proactive when it comes to actually listening to the white space, um, white space in general, finding opportunities to actually create trends and not so much follow trends. Um, so they can actually, um, spearhead and also overperform across their um, competitors has been the best way to do it. But as I mentioned, there are various ways uh, that companies could be looking at content trends or just in general industry uh, in order to be able to create their marketing or sales strategy for whether it's upcoming quarters or upcoming years. And that's just one of the Many ways that I could I could think within the perspective of social listening, but I'll give I'll give some room to Katya as well to share from brand, uh, because I love hearing actually how brands hands-on utilize uh, data sets and obviously uh, think about these things. I mean, as a consumer as well. I think I have uh, thank you, Tata. I think I have um, two things that I want to share on on the from the trans perspective and research and social listening and using other tools to understand your consumers i think number one um social media trends have definitely um been booming and we, we are getting um new trends pretty much every day i think it's from the luxury luxury segment and specifically specifically from luxury um beauty perspective um trying to stay on trends um of like specific content creation could be very detrimental to the um, to the brand identity itself. Um, we're not trying to be very loud. Uh, we're trying to be bold, but not very loud with the type of content we're creating. We're still a luxury segment, so we, we want to like, keep that identity. Um, so utilizing um, social listening and seeing how specifically in what are the trends not just in beauty or makeup i think a lot of a lot of social media trends are coming from makeup industry but specifically the skincare and utilizing like what is trending in the luxury skincare what type of content and what people are resonating with i think is very important rather than just jumping on every single trend 
possible. And I think um, the, the other the other thing I want to share is an example. Uh, actually, Rila and Sveta did um, a social listening study for Evlom a few months ago, and um, there was some very interesting um, trends and uh, some of the white white spaces that she presented, and um, we were fascinated by the uh, by the research. Uh, the two particular thing, and I think so you mentioned that that came up with um, segmentation and going after um, specific messaging uh, and be, be very targeted with your audience. And one of them was brides um, and um, get ready with me for um, the bridal routines, um, bachelorette gifts, um, and how those are trending with the skincare. And we, Evelyn had no exposure at that at that time. Um, another was uh, moms and mom blogs, and that audience is we also had a huge white space. So both of the we adapted both of those uh, findings in our strategy. We develop um, a bridal kit. We start looking for partnerships in the bridal space. We actually so we have a, a current uh, bridal kit that on the site, um, but we also start looking for partnerships with like different type of wedding um, photographers, makeup artists, um, uh, wedding dressmakers. And this and the second aspect of the like the mom blogs, the way we took it and interpreted, we actually uh, opened a pop-up in Hamptons during the time when um, kids were out of school and a lot of moms were in, in Hamptons with their children um, and kind of having that that experience for them having like small little parties and pampering sessions, which was um, very successful. So, so the thank you for the, for the for those findings. I think we took them and it was just fantastic. So like the, this is just the two things of like how the trends actually applied um, in a space. I am. I'm glad to hear. And actually, as you were talking, I realized I never have asked you, Katya, this question of, so when there's a trend in, in your industry, or whether it's something related to a competitor, how fast as a brand uh, can you jump on it? Because I know there are so many hoops with legal and, of course, messaging. And, of course, you have the strategy that you put together a year in advance or months in advance before you even kick it off. Do brands, not only Eve Long, but in your experience in the beauty industry, do brands really jump on trends and, and updates as they happen? Or are they mostly careful in terms of how much you're changing the strategy and the focus? Because as you mentioned, there are things that pop up almost every day. So you can't go for all of them. Otherwise, you would dilute your whole marketing strategy. But how do you guys approach that? I'm I'm very curious. I think some of, some of the things are really easy to implement and um, they kind of fall with the guidelines you already have, especially when you're talking about legal or compliance or anything like that. So we have a certain guidelines. Um, I think one of the one of the bigger things that came out this year and it's actually going back to the trends, what is trending, luxury, luxury skincare, what's trending. Um, globally not only in the united states is this going away from saying anti-agent and going into healthy agent because anti-agent has a as, as a wrong connotation and spe especially for women is that somehow we need to start stop aging while mm -hmm. uh where it's it's just it's not what's trying people don't people don't want to think about aging as something bad so there was a huge trend and like shift into healthy aging and you will see that on many brands that the brands start changing their um messaging around that interesting we we saw that and we started implementing it quite fast because we actually saw it, like our products are for women who are 35 Plus, and it, I, I want to say like our biggest chunk is between 40 and 55 year old. So it's like a lot of retinol based product, very active to help with um, looking, continue to look younger. Um, so we thought that that was very much on like part of our core. Um, we never say it's like, it's something that will be a quick fix. In order to see the results, you need to continue to use. And so we saw that that particular message and that trend was very on brand for us. And we start implementing it. So things sometimes it's easy to change something on a site, some of the language. But we still have on our packaging, we still found that some of the description does say anti-aging. 
So right. that, that will take longer. And I think, again, in speaking about digital, it's like you can shift really fast, but it's you can you can go after everything. You need to really think about your consumers, what's going to resonate with your consumers. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that totally makes sense. And again, as a brand, how do you make those decisions? And I'm sure that it's a very complex pro, uh, process in general, but very, very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, from when you're on the other side of things and you don't work on brand side, you think that when you make the recommendation, it should just be as easy to apply it as one, two, three. But then thinking from brand perspective, you actually realize that it, there's, it's a much more complex process and especially for a global brand like Evlom with multiple markets that are being serviced, um, I'm sure it's a, even more complex than than one could think. Cool. That that that's great, Katya and Sweta. Thank you so much. Great, great conversation. I, I think, yeah, as you rightly pointed, Sweta, like one finding insights and making recommendations is great from an agency perspective but from a brand standpoint you need to look at how actionable these insights are and you know and is it simple or complex especially like Katya as you mentioned if there's something on the package and you can't change it overnight you have to like wait for it add it into your whole brand guideline strategy and then change it probably for the next quarter next year probably you know and then deal with consumer uh, unrest if there is any you know during that meantime you know around that so there's a lot that goes behind uh, just finding insights right but my next question I think you already answered some of it uh, it's around audience segmentation and how to lay a strategy that uh, your specific audience segment understands or resonates with you gave some examples around setting up a pop-up store in Hamptons or you know or uh, the bridal uh, messaging for that specific segment. Uh, but if there's any more examples around, one, how important is audience segmentation in understanding consumer preferences? I think the answer is yes, we know it is important, but uh, but the question is, can you have, like, can you share any more examples around uh, successful audience focused strategies that you have encountered in your experiences? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, we are doing, uh, on top of the social listening, there's other research and, uh, that we're doing. Uh, one that I can specifically uh, give an example of is that we are servicing our, surveying our CRM data, so our existing customers um, on like their buying habits, on their lifestyle, what type of products they would like to see, what are they then happy and not happy with the experiences. And uh, we did one during the summer and it was, um, we were kind of shocked at how many customers actually want to talk to us about it and share their opinion. Um, I think one of the bigger things that come out out of that, we just realized that um, how different the audience were. So we have two domains, one in North America and one in uh, in the UK, how different the two audiences is because we thought that our consumers are very similar and have very similar interests um even the, they're not even the same age like that that kind of like in the us it was like a much younger professional woman um who cared about clean beauty um active ingredients uh big exposable income in the uk that woman was in her 50s and she was a early retire woman um with like very simple hobbies like gardening but she cared about like her appearances a lot but that different the difference between the two the groups was um unbelievable but that shifted of how we are mark like how we think about our consumers and how we're marketing on in two different markets mm -hmm. and do you guys have by the way different handles on social media for the uk and different markets like the US or is it one um one focus and I think target? that's I think that's a, such a loaded question and I I mean I would love to know how other brands approach it but so far in my career it's usually 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 either have like 15 different Instagram handles for each region that is important to the brand or you have just one yeah. um in uh, I think about two years ago, we did have multiple. We uh, decided to have only one. So we only have one Instagram account for servicing the whole brand. Same for 
YouTube, Facebook, and, and, and TikTok. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is poses a lot of issues, uh, especially when you want to be a market specific, when you want to communicate um, different messages. So it is posing complications, but um, so it's, it's it's definitely not perfect. And I honestly, through the last in the last ten years, I don't understand why it hasn't been solved, unless yeah. I'm unless I'm missing something, my colleagues missing something, maybe there is something. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, it's a, I think it's it is a very complex uh, item to talk about. So working with other brands as well. Um, outside of the industry, I have noticed that there is always a bit of confusion when it comes to, but we have different markets. How do we actually target each one of them when we have a global account? So prime example, Thanksgiving is a, is a holiday in the U.S., but it doesn't apply in the U.K. And Black Friday, which is huge in the U.S., for everyone, every brand retailer um, basically is after black friday so how do you leverage the global account to promote messaging and kind of like constantly remind your consumers that uh there is a sale or that there is some benefit to shopping on that day i've found it to be a fascinating one um from content perspective and like when it comes to demographics and audiences i can definitely piggyback on the market uh, discussion here that that we're having which is i've noticed in my work with global brands and and organizations that yeah there's quite a bit of stark difference not only between the consumers but also between the types of markets and how they react to messaging so think of it from both language perspective And when you're trying to utilize global English or analyze discussions in social media for global English, they're quite different than in the local language uh, when it comes to being able to compare how they how they react. Uh, So in um, in the audience segmentation piece for beauty specifically, not only for Eve Long, but in in general, we have noticed that um, being able to really get niche, the nicher, the better, even if that's that's an expression, I don't even know if nicher is a word, but the more niche you get, basically, it gets better uh, in terms of results and uh, attribution specifically. So obviously brands that are uh, within the market to sell a product are looking for that return. So that ROI on your ad dollars or ad spend, uh, so in that, and from that point of view, we've noticed that uh, brands have performed much better when they have really focused on their own um, segment and they have nurtured the segment over time. And especially with big sales, big holidays, again, Black Friday, um, being able to, to target your, your audience carefully and thoughtfully uh, would prove beneficial. And that's where really social listening and marketing, uh, marketing in general. So Katya mentioned other CRM data, being able to really examine all data sets and derive insights across the board is quite important. Cool. Thank you, Katya and Sweda. Um, I know we're already at 12.32, so we have like three to four minutes. Let's try to uh, wrap two more questions within this time frame. Uh, talking about social listening insights, I think it's it's a huge data set and it's very it's a very important data set, but it's not the only important data set, right? So we need to combine that with all of the kinds of data sets we have to arrive at the right strategy. So so combining social listening data with first party data, I think it's a powerful strategy. So can you provide examples of how this synergy has led to actionable insights? Uh, both from Evlom's perspective and Sweda from Brand's perspective. Yeah, sure. Katya, go ahead and I'll piggyback on yours. Yeah, I think I already provided like a, an example of, um, I think the the study that I mentioned that Sveta did uh, with Rila when we talked about like the weddings and um, the moms. Um, when kind of like, um, again, going back to the US because our UK uh audience very different but um when the mom's question arrived 
it's we start looking at our own CRM and, and actually uh, looking at if our shoppers are parents and if there's moms. So we can take that, replicate it, and acquire more customers. Um, the two the two join together, essentially the two data points, and um, that's how we arrived that the, uh, based on both social listening and our own survey, that this is a segment of customers that is performing really well and we're seeing uh, high LTVs um, through their shopping journey with us. Um, and it was very clear to us that the, this is the segment that we need to go after. So I think it's like, I already kind of shared that example, but I think it, it's really strong one. And piggyback on what you just said, um, I have seen and have worked on projects um, across the board where clients combine, uh, so again, data from internal resources or surveys that they have done across market research um, or even sessions, uh, if you will, but also uh, combining that with sales, so your sales numbers, or any other data set that you have access to. Prime example, we worked across research where um, the client, uh, which is or has been in the pharmaceutical space, is looking at numbers within a specific market. So for example, New York City and numbers of vaccines administered. Uh, so whether actually their efforts result and reflect the number of uh, patients who are willing to take a specific vaccine. Uh, so from sales perspective and sales numbers, um, again, the attribution piece or that conversion piece is, is quite important uh, for almost every brand that we work with. So combining social listening data, e-commerce data and numbers across especially specific campaigns and how those have translated and if they kind of walk hand in hand together uh, has been pretty significant. Uh, and yeah, uh, again, I mean, I could keep talking about various other data sets, but as an analyst, although I'm a geek, but I'm not really a data geek, like it's hard to explain, um, I do think that brands should never trust one source of truth. So uh, consumer insights and social listening is a great start, but it's not the finish and it's not the end. Uh, taking into account, obviously, the brand perspective, all the brand data, accessible, historic, look, reviewing historic trends, reviewing historic time, periods and campaigns that have been done, and combining along with other data sets is crucial. So you can't just look at one. You have to really take multiples. Fantastic. Thank you, Katya and Sveta. Uh, let's do one more question and then dive into audience questions here. Uh, this is more for Thread, I guess. Um, again, speaking of luxury beauty, the two big social media channels that come to our minds are TikTok and Instagram. So given how dynamic these platforms are, how do brands stay ahead of curve, off the curve in identifying and capitalizing of emerging trends, uh, especially in these channels? Mm, I love this question. I was going to say because I don't have a good answer for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it makes sense. It does make sense that the beauty industry is specifically focused on Instagram and TikTok. I mean, think about it. These are visual platforms where consumers literally absorb everything that they see. And both platforms provide brands the ability to do e-commerce or shopping uh, basically online very seamlessly, integrated very seamlessly. And that's been their whole model since the start. Um, I think obviously with Instagram, which was bought by Meta, like it has evolved quite significantly. And I do believe that we're going to see trends on that specific channel uh, that will be close to or head into proximity with what we have in TikTok. Uh, but brands just have to have the dedication. I mean, the, I think that's the really the only solution right now until Chat GPT or another AI platform can be integrated with those and maybe it can help us figure out how to stay on top of trends. Um, leveraging, again, social listening vendors and being able to set up specific alerts for whether it's volume related for specific spikes or even uh, white space opportunities uh, could be one way to do it. But honestly, if you don't have the headcount on the team or the person who really specializes in in that and can dedicate the time, I think it would be really challenging uh, to give you a really very challenging Gotcha, cool. Thank you so much for that, uh, Sveta. 
uh, I think, yeah, let's open the floor for questions and then. Uh, sorry, I hear myself. I hear an echo as well. I think it might be your head. Gotcha. Gotcha. Oh, I still hear oh, myself. I still hear myself. Oops. Oops. I think someone can mute. I think someone them. can mute them. Is it coming from your end? No. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I hear myself. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, so I. I'll talk. I mean, I feel like I'm. Um, Do you want to remove your headset? I think that might help. Uh, should I remove my headset? You said. I can hear it better now as soon as you removed it. Yeah. Okay, that is uh, interesting. Do you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay, I don't hear myself now. Okay, cool. Sorry. Uh, sorry for that uh, uh, little uh, disturbance there. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much, Shweta and Katya. That was great. Uh, let's try to take some questions. And uh, dear attendees, uh, feel free to type your questions as we speak. Uh, but we have one. Let's go with that. Uh, as we look ahead, what emerging trends do you foresee in the intersection of social media and luxury beauty? And how can brands prepare for and adapt to these evolving trends? Mm, wow. Tough question. Uh, I don't think I have a good answer for it. Outside of possibly I could foresee that in 2024, again, AI steps into the social listening game uh, to help all brands, not only uh, the beauty industry, but all brands perhaps with more automated analytics and also uh, content identification. I mean, we've seen some of it happen with multiple platforms in the social listening space that have integrated uh, various AI tools for analysis where you can basically get um, summary of analysis specific data sets. I think more and more uh, BI tools and AI tools in 2024 will be competing for that space. So I could just foresee that the space completely shifts and also the need for um, analytics is will be quite different, I think, from this year. I mean, we already see that, and I wouldn't be surprised if that happens as soon as January 1. Yeah, actually, the AI portion is um, very interesting. I Not only speaking about social media space, but I'll come back to it in a second. Um, every single vendor um, email or phone call I get is somehow some kind of AI tool from um, social listening uh, with AI for reviews when it's can scrape um, other sites and like bring that data, which I thought was very interesting, uh, to um, making a recommendation of what kind of price you should do, how you uh, automatically segment your audience and showing them different discounts. Um, uh, but I think um, the bigger portion of um, like BI and AI combined, some of the tools are already now start giving you recommendations. If before it was just, just the data and kind of like interpreted the way you want it, I think for smaller businesses is quite hard to sit there and not have an analyst and try to um, look at the data. We know what the data is saying, but how do we implement that? Like how, and what is it gonna improve for us and what the outcome is gonna be? And there's a lot of BI tools right now that are uh, will give you recommendations on what kind of segments you should be going after, what you should try, what you should do more of. Um, so that's um, I'm foreseeing that to be like getting even more and more uh, popular. Um, yeah, AI is is gonna is, is definitely gonna dominate the especially digital market market in 2024. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah, I already see it. I mean, I see it across the board from analysis to content to how people operate. I mean, to basically bots then on top of some of these vendors. So I agree. No doubt it will be the thing for 2024. 
That's cool. Thank you so much, uh, Katya Tsweda. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, again, getting recommendations is great, but I believe, you know, human intervention is still a necessity there. Because, uh, yeah, I would still not trust AI and its recommendations fully. I mean, yes, it, it'll make my life easy in terms of, hey, you know what, I don't have to look through all these data sets and understand what's coming out of that. Like automated analysis is always helpful, but I will take it from there. I will let the AI rest its uh, case there, and I will take it from there to see what recommendations you know I can make. So, but again, it's 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 going to be tricky. Like you know, working in coordination with AI might be more useful than trusting AI fully. Uh, but yeah, we can take one more question. Uh, uh, we don't have any from the audience yet, uh, but. I was thinking of celebrity-based luxury beauty products um, and what impact would that have on the other existing luxury beauty products and brands? Uh, because again, celebrities come with a lot of their own credibility, the influence they have. So yeah, if, if you're mm -hmm. seeing anything around that as to, okay, you know, we can't sell without a celebrity kind of uh, thing, you know, if there's something like that, let's talk about that a bit and then we can end the session. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about it. So we actually did a study on celebrity beauty brands and their impact on the industry. Um, yeah. Recently, what we found that was interesting, or at least to me, is that celebrities do have quite the impact. When it comes to beauty brands, uh, even yesterday we published a research on road skin by Hall Hallie Bieber uh, and how that has impacted some of the... Um, brands in in its own segment, if you will. Uh, interesting things that do come up is that if you actually walk into Sephora, uh, you will now see the shift towards those uh, celebrity beauty brands as well. Consumers really care, and what we know from the research we conducted is that consumers still care about the price point, but I almost feel like not so much when it comes to buying a favorite um, product from a celebrity beauty brand. Uh, we analyzed brands such as Kylie Cosmetics and then the Kim Kardashian uh, the portfolio of brands, uh, as well as um, uh, Selena Gomez and, and several others. And uh, yeah, consumers complain about, you know, the tints that they're getting uh, or the colors of specific lipsticks, uh, but they weren't so much preoccupied with pricing. So I think that that's a huge shift that I do expect will continue. Um, in terms of trend, and I do think that this trend will actually become more of a global uh, global trend. So while in the U.S. market we have specific celebrities uh, with their own products, I think on a global scale we'll see we'll see that happening. But if you think about celebrities and influencers in general, let's uh, yeah we can we can talk quite a bit about how brands have been leveraging influencers in order to promote messaging within the beauty industry and then the impact that they have um, nowadays because consumers don't want to see your average or regular uh, model or supermodel anymore. They want to see people like them. And that's that's why influencers have been so successful. And many of those influencers have also become celebrities um, with their own brands or without their own brands. But that's just several of the, several of the things I wanted to highlight. Yeah, I think I honestly think there's um, it's two completely different worlds. Like when it comes to celebrities and uh, influencers, now we're seeing if before we start seeing um, like a bigger celebrities coming up with their beauty brands, and I mean we have quite a few of those in on the U.S. market. Uh, now influencers are coming up with their own beauty brands. I just we saw a. a I can't remember what her name is, but she just came up with a skincare that is tinted or something like that. She's been all, like, I've been targeted with the ads on Instagram and I was like, oh, good for her. Um, so <laughs> even, I think it's like, if you already have an existing audience, an existing audience, it's, it's um, much easier to influence that purchasing behavior. But going back to the global aspect of it, uh, celebrity beauty brands are doing fantastic in the UK. Like Kate Moss brand is doing really, really well in mm. the UK. My, uh, our brand, Evlom, um, so on the, glo on the global scale, right? So it's like the Asian market and China market specifically is really big for us, but it's almost like 
they have such a different value, such a different aesthetic of um, and what their consumers are looking for in a brand. So, um, so we almost kind of have a segregated marketing strategy or even product strategy. Um, we launched a campaign in in the end of in the beginning of September with um, with a top three celebrity in China, and um, that had such a tremendous splash, and people were um, we were getting messaging even outside of China that the consumers, the new consumers were like fleeing to us to purchase what that ambassador was promoting with the messaging, as long as he is an ambassador, I'll, I'll be continuing buying your product. So I, uh, in the US, I feel like there's still, there is an influence of um, your favorite celebrity and kind of purchasing the product. Um, but it's definitely more towards like who I want to be and like somebody like looks like me. I think that's that's a very uh, good point, Sveta. But like celebrities, this guy is male and majority of our products are female and it's um, not female. They're like gender neutral, but the consumers who we acquired were female who are just, uh, I don't know, appreciate the celebrity so much. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, yeah. to be fair and to be honest, uh, my skincare, uh, most of my skincare gets utilized by my husband, so I have to hide <laughs> my nicer skincare because I do I do agree a lot of the products and you know beauty strategies, including of Eve Lom, um, are they they are gender neutral. So whether celebrities are promoting them or not is not always as important as to what type of product is it and does it apply to me as a human as someone who basically would like to pamper themselves and make make themselves feel good or take care of themselves ultimately uh, but i do i do foresee that there will be more of that celebrity influence as the markets progress as global trends progress and change um over time because in the us we've already we're already oversaturated, if you will, on celebrities. And then when you when you put that into perspective of uh, the European market, which is a very mature market, that's not happening just yet or not to the same scale that we're seeing here. So I do see that trend and wave shifting more and more. Um, yeah, east, east of uh, North America. <laughs> Cool, fantastic. Thank you so much, Katya. So I think we're already out of time here, so let's wrap this up. Uh, once again, Katya, Sveta, really appreciate all those insights. Uh, great discussion, great conversation. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. Uh, and all our lovely attendees, thank you so much for joining us so today. today. We will be seeing you in the session soon. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Have a lovely day. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. You. Bye. Okay.